This morning, uh, we're going to take some time and wrestle with uh, a fairly challenging passage from the life of Jesus, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to talk this morning, the life you long for, accountability in community. We're going to talk about accountability in the community of God's people. Would you read with me, Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, if your brother or your sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, Whatever you have bound on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if you on earth, if two of you can agree on anything that you ask for, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This morning would you say amen with me? Amen. One of my uh, favorite things about Jesus Uh, is that he never gives a trigger warning. (laughs) He never warns people, hey, what I'm about to teach is pretty, pretty tough. He just digs into it. And this morning, I wanna wanna deal with this, this little section on confrontation. And then immediately afterwards, near the end of my sermon before the pie, I wanna look at a parable that Jesus tells at the end of this. So I'm gonna break this up into kind of two sections here. But for those of you who hear the words of Jesus, I, I want to name on the front end, I want to name on the front end, um, before I continue, I, I want to name on the front end that for some of us in our lives, um, we have heard this scripture weaponized in a really dangerous way. Um, for people in this room who have experienced abuse, sexual abuse, marital abuse, physical abuse, we have heard this teaching be abused in such a way as if to say, just forgive and move on. And I wanna begin by saying, for the person who has been abused and has had this text weaponized, that is not the heart of God. For the person who has experienced tremendous pain as a result of abuse or these sorts of situations, I stand with our mental health counselors in this room, I stand with you, and I say there is mercy for you to take your time to grieve and process. But this was not intended to put you in a position of feeling like you are not given permission to walk through the grief of of pain. With that said, I also wanna say, some of you have also heard this used in a way that says that if somebody walks away from the church, that we're supposed to treat them really badly. Treat them, Jesus says, as you would pagans or tax collectors. It doesn't sound that pleasant. Immediately you hear that and you go, well, does that mean then we're supposed to, somebody who walks away, we're supposed to treat them disrespectfully, dishonor them, so on so forth. I just wanna remind you, who is writing this little section of Jesus? <laughs> Matthew, who, by the way,'s occupation was a tax collector. And if there is anybody who knows how Jesus treats tax collectors, it is Matthew. Jesus is not saying if somebody walks away, you treat them poorly. He's actually saying if somebody walks away, you treat them with grace and kindness. With that said, Jesus here is going to teach us how to confront things. I remember years ago reading a book that <clears throat> was about Christian parenting. And the, the thesis of the book was this. Parents should never argue in front of their kids because you will just treat your kid, you'll teach your kids that the marriage is not secure. And I wanna say, bull roar. <laughs> That's a theological term, by the way. It is striking to me how many confrontations we have in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, for Jesus, 
for Paul. Go read Galatians. Confrontation is a part of the Christian story. And for Jesus here, he's not telling us, pretend as though everything is fine. He's actually inviting us into the difficulties of relationship. I would actually argue that kids, I'm not telling you if you're a parent, go like fabricate an argument today. But I am saying this, if we start our arguments in front of our kids and then go into the back room, we're teaching our kids how to start arguments and never teach them how to reconcile. Jesus is not interested here in just teaching us how to do confrontation. He is simultaneously modeling for us how to live into a reconciling community. That we know how to, be con- we know how to confront, but we know how to reconcile. It's striking, by the way, you'll notice, this is only the second time in Matthew's gospel, and there are only two times in all of the gospels where Jesus even references the church. Only two times, both in Matthew's gospel. You remember that other one where Jesus says uh, that the gates of Hades cannot in any way, shape, or form overcome the power of the church. Praise God. The only other time Jesus ever references the ecclesia, the church, is right here, and it has to do with confrontation. Part of church is living in accountability to one another. I want you to see three things this morning, the hope of reconciliation, the practice of confrontation, and a path towards restoration. The hope of restoration, reconciliation. We've gotta begin by believing, we've gotta begin by addressing the the hope of Jesus here because when you hear Jesus make make comments like this, teach like this, it's easy to sort of not see the whole picture. When in reality, the whole picture is that Christ, Jesus, created a community of people that are reconciled by God who, be, who are reconcilers. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says, because you've been reconciled to God, you have the reconciliation ministry to other people. We extend to others what we've received from God. God is the reconciler. Paul even says in 2 Corinthians that Christ, 1 Corinthians, Christ will come and reconcile all things, all things, In the Greek, you know what it says? All things. Everything. That's a lot of stuff. The full reconciliation of all things. Now, let's let's zoom out just a little bit and talk about reconciliation. What does that mean? What does it mean to reconcile? I want to read uh, Isaiah 11. This is a a prophecy from the Old Testament about uh, Isaiah is, is writing in this tumultuous time in the life of Israel, and he gives this prophetic vision of a time in the future when some guy would come, some person from the lineage of David would come upon whom the spirit would rest. This is the way Isaiah describes it. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge, the fear of the Lord, and he will, del- with, will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what he sees with the eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. Continue. Next slide, if you could, Pam. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. The young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the fox. And the infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So Isaiah is giving this vision. There's going to come a time when this person will come upon whom the Spirit has rested. And the result of this reality, this person, the Mashiach, the anointed one, the Messiah, is that all of these things in the natural world that eat each other, predators, Things that in the normal world eat each other. Isaiah says, when that one comes, all of these enemies will all of a sudden be lying down together. A lion will lie down with the lamb, the ox and the cow, the cobra and the child, the enemies. The sign, the sign that the Messiah has come is the great reconciliation has begun. So do we see that in the life of Jesus? 
Uh, There's a story, you may remember it, in Mark chapter one, where Jesus goes into the wilderness. Uh, He uh, has just been anointed by the Spirit. By the way, the way way Mark tells the story, he's just been anointed by the Spirit. The Spirit has fallen on Jesus, and Jesus is immediately sent out into the wilderness by the Spirit. And this is what happens, Mark chapter one. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the Jordan. John of the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open, the spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, you're my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. Look at this line. This is awesome. Jesus was with the wild animals. And angels attended him. Now, Mark is the only one that picks up this detail. He's the only gospel writer who sees this little tiny detail. But did you notice that when Jesus is anointed by the Spirit, he goes out of the wilderness, and then all of a sudden, he's with the lions and tigers and bears, oh my. (laughs) These are not folks. These are not little cute pets. These aren't parrots. These are animals, wild animals that eat people. And all of a sudden, Jesus is just hanging out with a bunch of crazy animals. Richard Bauckham is a New Testament scholar who argues that Mark is winking at the audience. That whole Isaiah guy, he's here. By the way, look at Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees hated each other. By the way, in the first century, we look at them and they're like, well, you know, we think maybe they were friends. They hated each other. They hated each other, except when it came to Jesus. And all of a sudden, they were besties. They were like, we gotta get rid of this guy. It is ironic that even in his crucifixion, Christ brings enemies together. Very common purpose. You know, when you, when you read the storyline of the Bible, there, I, how far does reconciliation go? It's a, it's a crazy thing to ask. Uh, there was this brilliant little article written by Miroslav Volf a number of years ago called The Final Reconciliation, and he asked the question. It's, it's, I think it's a really important question. Do you remember that story in the Old Testament where Cain murders his brother Abel? Over, by the way, religious jealousy. His brother's sacrifice was acceptable, but his wasn't, and, and Cain takes him out and he murders him. <clears throat> Miroslav Wolf asks, he says, you know, what if both, what if Cain and Abel both had a come to Jesus moment? They got saved, they were in the community. What would church look like for Cain and Abel? He even asks, like, what will heaven be like for Cain and Abel if they're, in the, if they're together? And he asks this. I think this is a really interesting question. It's uncomfortable. He asks this. Would you put it up on the screen, Pam? The Miroslav Wolf quote. Yeah, that one. If Cain and Abel were to meet again in the world to come, what would need to have happened between them for Cain not to be able to avoid Abel's luck and for Abel not to want to get out of Cain's way? And his point is this. Could it be that reconciliation is so extravagant that even Cain and Abel could reconcile? Years ago, Karl Barth, the great theologian, was once asked by one of his snarky undergraduate students, He was asked, will I see my loved ones in heaven, Dr. Bart? And Dr. Bart is reported to have responded with, oh, not only your loved ones. (laughs) And the point is, folks, the reconciliation of Jesus is not just a bunch of people who get together who like each other. It's way deeper than that. It's a community of people who have been hurt by each other, who even hurt each other. And yet, through Christ, find peace. Now, how do we get there? So that's the vision. I mean, the hope Paul says that is, that is the new creation, is going to be a world of total reconciliation. That is our future. That's the goal. Jesus just brought an appetizer. He just gave some hors d'oeuvres. You want to know what the new creation is like? We just got a little snippet. 
And in order for that to happen, it appears as though Jesus says, it's not going to happen just by like, just walking around and being all graceful in your heart. There's actually a process to reconciliation. For Jesus, it goes through confrontation. I want you to see a few things about what Jesus said here. Because Jesus, he's going to give us some brilliant ideas about how to confront things in a community like our own. How do you confront sin? How do you confront things that are difficult? You don't just walk into the room and everybody's reconciled because we're in the room together. It takes work and effort. Reconciliation is not something that you just put in the microwave and wait for the ding. You gotta sit in the kitchen for hours and work just like some of you did to make pie. It takes time and energy. And this is what Jesus says to do. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out his fault just between the two of you. And if they'll listen, you've won them over. I just want to focus on that one verse. I want to focus on just that one verse. I want you to see five things about what Jesus does here. He gives us five just crystal clear, beautiful little instructions on how to confront stuff. And by the way, I'm going to bet most of us are not good at confrontation. And if that's you, we're so glad you're here. If this is your first time, I'm confronting you. And that's an awkward first step in the right direction. Let me see five things. Number one, notice this. Jesus says, if your brother or sister, Adelphoi, it's the word for brother, if your brother or sister sins against you, or they sin. Now, that, why, why would Jesus say, if your brother or sister sin? I, by the way, have no biological brother and sister. So is Jesus not speaking to me? No, 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 no. Something else is going on here. In the New Testament, that phrase, brother and sisters, or brothers, is a very important hotspot. It, 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 when you double click on that phrase, it has a broader meaning here, and here's what's going on. You're gonna notice that for Jesus, what Jesus means by family is not always the same thing as what you and I believe family is. For example, you, you remember this. Do you remember when Jesus' Jesus mother and brothers come to him He's, he's teaching, he's with his disciples, and they come to Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, you're doing some great stuff, but aren't you taking this a little too far? They, come, they confront Jesus, and Jesus' response is, who is my mother and my brothers but the ones who are doing God's will? Now, I'm not Mary. I'm not a mom, but if I heard somebody talking like that to a mom, I'd be like, Oh, no, you didn't. I'm your mom. I'm your brother. You got to think James and, uh, James and Jude are like, bro, what? You're my dog. Like, we've been in the family together this whole time. You got other brothers? Let us in. What, what, what are you talking about? Because for Jesus, family was not just your bio family. There was this other thing going on. It, it's the community of the disciples, the people who are following Jesus. I, this is exactly what Jesus is doing when John, by the way, records the crucifixion of Jesus. John describes that when Jesus is being crucified, Jesus looks down from the cross and he says to his mom, hey mom, take care of John. And he says to John, take care of my mom. Well, they're creating a family. This is exactly what Paul is talking about in Romans 16 when he says, hey, I want you to, he, reads, he greets like 38 people. And he says, hey, I also want, Paul writes this, I want you to greet Rufus and also his mother who is a mother to me. It's funny. You know what Paul never, he never says to people that they are his friends. He calls them brothers and sisters. He calls Timothy, <laughs> he calls Timothy, my true son in the faith. Scholars call it, we have, scholars have a word for this, they call it fictive family. And the idea of fictive family is this, it's not fictional family, but it's the idea that this is a community of people who are finding a new social context, a new family in the community of Jesus. It is a new community that is being forged not around genetics, not around your 23andMe app. 
It is a new family that is being forged around the Father in heaven and Christ who brings us together and the Spirit who anoints us. I gotta tell you, that is incredible news for people in the room who don't have very good biological families. Because here, your family, your brother, your sister, your family. In a way, I gotta be honest with you, this is uncomfortable. I'll give you a trigger, trigger warning, even if Jesus doesn't. In a way, this, it relativizes the nuclear family just a little bit. And what I mean by that is, um, I actually have a suspicion that in the church, again, I don't think this is just a suspicion, I think I've seen it, we have done a terrific job at making the nuclear family the goal. Uh, we've made marriage the goal. It, it, I, I would even go so far as to say, if I haven't made you uncomfortable already in saying that, I think we've idolized marriage. Um, when I was in Bible college, my Bible college literally had a saying, ring by spring or your money back. <laughs> and that is why I'm in counseling. <laughs> is stuff like that, is stuff like that. Can I just say this? Is this okay to say the goal of the Christian life is not marriage, it's following Jesus? And why that's really important is there's a bunch of single people in this room who have been made to feel like you're second class citizens for not being married. And I wanna say in Jesus' name, that's baloney. You're awesome. I am not saying everybody should be single. Some of us are called to marriage, some of us are called to singleness. But I just wanna remind you, church, we worship a single guy. <laughs> the goal of the Christian life, the goal of the Christian life is not marriage, it's following Jesus. And that means whether you're single or whether you're married, here you are family together. Great news. And it is in that context that Jesus says, confronts sin. Here's why this is so important for us. We tend to think that the church should be the place that we go to to get away from confrontation. And I wanna suggest actually the church is the place where we go to learn how to do it really well. That we don't use the church as a way to hide from difficulty, we go to the church as a place to address it. There should be no better place for us to learn how to confront each other than here. In a way, I even wanna say, I think we're actually called to be harder on ourselves than the world. And sadly, we have often become too good at critiquing our culture rather than addressing our own sins. Brothers and sisters, Jesus says, this is a family deal that we confront in family. I also want you to see this. He says, when you confront, you do so, brothers and sisters, when they sin, do we, do we need to talk about sin? Do we need to say like, do we need to do it? Do we need to confront sin in the church? And I gotta tell you, we absolutely have to be a community of people that confront sin. We, we, if there is no place to confront sin, and we've done great, we have done great at talking about the effects of sin, shame, trauma, We've done a great job of talking about the effects of sin, but I, I think we are not just called to address the symptoms. I think we're called to address the disease. I, I was reading just recently, I was reading a book that was a history of revival, and it said that when you look at any revival on any college campus ever in the history of America, there have always been two components. Number one, people who have been praying fervently and they remind a strong theology of sin, calling people to repentance. I don't know where it was along the way, but I got this little motto. Somebody teach, taught me, I don't know where it was, but this little line that said something like this. You know, the Holy Spirit is, is the one who confronts sin. The Holy Spirit does it. And by the way, do I agree with that? Yeah, I believe that. But it just so turns out, even though the Holy Spirit is the one who confronts sin, even though that's true, we're still called to do it. We don't get to use the Holy Spirit as a hall pass to not have to do the hard work of living in community. 
We are called to live in a community that actually vocalizes and names ways in which people are walking in a dangerous, dark direction. What kills me is that we've even gotten a place in this sort of crazy, insane, politicized moment that we live in. Is it's, we've even found a way to politicize sin. And what I mean by that is like, when you look at conservatives and progressives, you know, I've noticed uh, as a, you know, I'm more, way more conservative, I'm uh, uh, terrifyingly conservative theologically. And I've noticed about myself and people in my tradition, I found that we're really good at confronting individual sin. We're really good at that. We're really good at confronting the sins of individuals. And I gotta be honest, I think when I look at progressives, they tend to be really good at focusing on systemic sin, the sin of the system. And the more and more I reflect on it, the more and more I'm convinced we don't get to pick which side. We are called to confront any thing that is not God's way, be it individual or systemic. I'm called to both. I'm called to both. It's, it's, it's really hard, I gotta be honest, I'll, I'll just name something on behalf of one of your pastors here because I, I'm, I, I get the privilege of teaching, I'm not on staff here to be a, a, you know, one, of your, you know, one of your awesome full-time pastors. I gotta tell you, it's a really hard time in history to confront sin because at our moment in history, very often when you do end up doing it, people often end up just finding another church to go to. And what happens is we're like, well, I'm not getting what I want here, so I'm just gonna go somewhere else. And I gotta say, that, that can create a lot of immaturity that we just walk away and go somewhere else when we start hearing things we don't wanna hear. This is your family. And when we call each other out on our stuff, it's love. And then Jesus says, okay, to your brother and sister, if they sin, go to them. Go to them. He says, go, physically go to them. Now, this is, of course, in a world, Jesus, you know, the disciples couldn't have texted each other. They'd be like, well, brother, I just saw something this week that I'm really concerned about. You couldn't email each other. You couldn't, like, make a TikTok video correcting them. You know, you had to go to them. You had to actually do it. And I want to say, there's some brilliance in that. Because I made the mistake, and so have you, of trying to correct sin over digital mediums, texting, emailing, you, you know, all that stuff. And let's just name it, it doesn't work. Because words can only be interpreted as words when you're not face to face. Jesus tells us, go to them, go to them. Look them in the face. Buy them a coffee. Buy them two coffees. <laughs> but sit with them. Don't text them, don't email them, don't write, make a TikTok video. I can't tell you how many times I've had to learn this lesson of confronting in digital mediums. It just doesn't work. As best as you can, go to them if it's safe. If it's unsafe, that's a different scenario. And then he says, point out their fault to them. Notice Jesus doesn't say their faults. It's not plural, singular. Why is that important? Because apparently, the right way of confronting is that when you come to confront somebody, you don't have a record of wrongs, you just got one thing, which we are horrible at. We, we get like a little hurt, and then a little bit more hurt, and then we, before we know it, we've got this scroll of grievances. And we show up and we're like, well, I've got 44,000 things to share with you today. And you're like, well, I don't even know, how do you confront that? He says your fault, which implies that you've been doing a great job of keeping the relationship current up to that point. You don't have a record of wrongs. You got one thing because you've been intimate up to this point. I remember Pete Scazzaro once saying, you know what, you know what I've learned about the elephant, you say elephants in the room, it's a thing that nobody's talking about, it's there. He goes, you know what I've learned about elephants in the room? Little elephants, they always grow up into big elephants. And when you leave the little elephants, they always grow up and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger with over time. I think what's going on here is I think he's saying like, don't have a list, just have a thing. And then he says, between the two of you, this is the antidote to gossip. Don't go to other people, first go to them, if you can. If it is an unsafe scenario, then get somebody else and address it in a more broad context. But if it's possible, go one-on-one. -on -one. I gotta be honest with you. 
because I haven't been up to this point. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you. Hearing Jesus teach on this stuff really, really, really terrifies me because I'm scared of finishing my sermon and having a long line of people <laughs> that wanna talk to me. <laughs> I don't wanna preach this because I don't wanna do it. I don't wanna do it because it terrifies me. I had my review this week at work. <laughs> my boss is awesome. He started the review. He said, AJ, you're a rock star around here. And I was like, I know. <laughs> I know. And then he goes, but I need to tell you something. You need to learn to collaborate better because when you're by yourself, you work really hard and you get stuff done, but you really need to learn to do it with our team. Because I am better by myself. I am better by myself. I accomplish more. I get stuff done faster. I write more. I don't want to work with people. I don't want to. I don't want to have to deal with stuff. I don't want to. The goal of the Christian life, folks, this is not about happiness, it's about holiness. And the reality is, if I'm just looking for happiness, the church, the church is not a good fit because it's just gonna slow us down. You know what the church does? You know what the church does? It just slows us all down. It slows everybody down, it slows everything up, I don't get to go as fast as I want, and I want to say I don't like it, and it is God's will. Because the goal of the Christian, I heard one of my mentors once said to me, you know what the opposite of, of holiness is? He said the opposite of holiness is hurry. I wanna read this quote to you. This is a guy, if you haven't read everything he's written, I wanna read this quote to you. And I want, this is from a guy named Rol, R Ronald Rollheiser in his book, Holy Longing. Listen to this. When the church community takes away from us our false what the church community takes away from us is our false sense of unencumberedness. That we could, f we could finally soar like birds, believing that we are mature, loving, committed, and not blocking things out that we should be seeing. Real church going soon enough shatters that illusion and gives us no escape. As we find ourselves constantly humbled, as our immaturities and lack of sensitivity to the pain of others are reflected off eyes that are honest and unblinking. It's like we want God, but we don't want the church. And I wanna say, it is possible to get God without the church. You can seek God without the church, but I worry that it will leave you immature. This thing should slow us down so that we're together. I wanna, I wanna read this to you. This is immediately after this, immediately after this, Jesus tells a little parable, and I promise you, I'll, I'll give me five more minutes. Or 30, just. <laughs> Jesus gives a parable, listen to this. So, so, so right after Jesus tells this whole thing about confrontation, listen to this. Then Peter came to Jesus, you guys love Peter. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, well, Lord, how many times am I supposed to forgive? And Jesus said, he goes, Peter says, should it be seven times? And Jesus says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king, listen to this, a king, who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, mind you, do you remember that time when Paul says, I would rather you speak one word than 10,000 words of tongues? In Greek, the highest number is 10,000. It's a way of saying infinity. Back to it. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 infinity bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that, he ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that had been sold to repay the debt. 
At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Listen to this. Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which in our moment in history would be about $18. He grabbed him and choked him. Pay back what you owe me, he said. His fellow servants fell to their knees and begged, be patient with me and I'll pay back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until that he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went to the master with everything. Then the master called the servant and you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailer to be tortured until he should pay it back. <laughs> This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Who needs a nap after that? (laughs) Holy moly, Jesus. I thought the whole thing about confrontation was hard. And here's what I need you to see. I need you to see, first of all, reconciliation, even for God, hear this. Reconciliation, restoration, includes accountability. Did you notice that God does not ignore the debt of the man? The father, the king does not ignore the debt of the man. And why that's important is this. Confrontation is important enough. God does not ignore debts. The king does not ignore debts. There's this weird form of Christianity that says, just forgive them in their heart and don't confront it. And I want to say, even God doesn't do that. He confronts. He names. Restoration includes the naming of sin. And I also want to say restoration doesn't mean that you become the same as the person you're restored to. Meaning it doesn't mean that, you like, that you're not different afterwards. The ultimate vision of reconciliation in the Bible is John looking at heaven and saying, I see every tribe and tongue. How can he say every tribe and tongue is there? Because not everybody in heaven looked like him and not everybody spoke his language. Restoration. The kingdom, friends, the new creation will be a place where we are reconciled in the beautiful bodies God has given to us and the beautiful culture we have been born into. Heaven is the place where even different people come together in the name of Jesus with God at the throne. Restoration is not the absence of difference. I also want to say this. Look at this. Restoration always gives more than is asked for. The man in this story who was forgiven his debt didn't even ask to have his debt forgiven. He asked for more time. He asked for more time and he gets grace. We always get more than we ask for with God. And I wanna close that ultimately, friends, restored people restore. And enslaved people enslave. When you and I walk in the grace of Jesus, it is our responsibility and our calling to extend to one another the grace we have received. And to not do so is to withhold the power of blessing. To receive grace is to give it. You can't give what you don't have. But when you have grace, you give it away. A friend of mine is a pastor in the region. You you actually know him, but I I have not been given permission to use his name. He said, just anonymize the story. But a friend of mine pastors a church uh, in our area. And a woman, uh, part of his church, who was on the staff, uh, it was discovered that she had been stealing money from the church for about two decades nearly $50,000, it was this huge amount of money. And my friend decided the right thing to do, of course, is you gotta confront it, he did. She was utterly broken and repentant. And then he decided to do what I thought was the most beautiful thing. 
he and the elders in the community decided to bring this woman to the community so she could name her sin, so that people could forgive her. And he describes being in the room as she names it, and people coming up to her afterwards and embracing her and forgiving her. And I wanna close by saying, the goal for Jesus here is not just confrontation, it is always restoration, as much as possible. Is she gonna get her job back? No. If we've abused our power, we shouldn't get that power back. But the reality is the heart of Jesus is the making right of all things. It's pie day. And I gotta tell you folks, this ain't our first pie day. This ain't our first pie day. Some of you are like, oh, we're gonna do pie day. It's all cool and new. It ain't new. <laughs> Where's Andy Gilbert? Where you at, bro? Where you at? I don't know. You're around, floating around. Okay, he's back here. I remember our first pie day. I remember you telling, we do pie day because in the olden days, when you wanted to reconcile with somebody, you brought a pie to their house. And you brought a pie and you ate pie together. And you said, I love you. And they say, I love you back. And you eat together. Pie day ain't new. <laughs> this is a part of the church's history, and we stand in the tradition <laughs> of Pie Day. I want to invite you today, as we close. The church, we do pie. We also do communion. And if today there is somebody in the room that you need to reconcile with, I want to invite you to do this. I want you to get some communion elements, and I want you to pull that person aside and what, whatever you sense Jesus doing here, if you need to reconcile, the table is here. If you need to worship, just worship. If you need to come down here, get on your knees and worship God. If you need prayer in the back, get prayer. But this is one of those things that Jesus gives to us. It's hard, it's heavy, and it's hard not to respond to this stuff. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we close our time, thank you for Pi Day. But more than anything, thank you for your word your love and your mercy. As we respond, Jesus, to your words of living in community in accountability, it's painful and difficult to have to look at the hard things. But Jesus, this is not a community where we run from the truth. This is a place where we run to it. And here, God, in this room, there's immense grace. But may there also be truth. Grace and truth, Jesus grace and truth. We love you, God. In the name of Christ, amen. Would you stand with me?